Uh, ultimately, uh, as I said before, we are uh, we are here to talk a little bit about some local history. Um, that's sort of the point of this, sort of tying it with uh, the season seven of Finding Your Roots uh, with uh, um, Lewis, uh, Lewis Gates Jr. And uh, with me uh, in the, uh, I'll say in the studio, but here on Zoom because we're still doing stuff virtual uh, because of COVID, but hopefully that'll be sort of changing soon. Uh, but um, what's uh, what we're going to talk about, let me, let me shut something off here real quick. Uh, okay. So with me, like I said, it was is uh, Patrick Carr uh, and uh, um, Ron Joloff, both uh, currently from Chester County. So we're going to talk a little bit about their lives and their perspective on some local history and get some insight. And uh, hopefully you enjoy it as much as I do, because I really enjoy talking about local history and some of the stuff I, I, I um, never know about. I'm going to have, uh, give uh, each of you guys a, a, a couple of minutes to talk about your, yourself um, bio. Um, and uh, I've been warned that uh, I, I may have to cut people off <laughs> if if they start talking, but I, I may not cut them off because I find it too interesting. So I'm going to start with uh, actually with Patrick and have Patrick kind of give me a little bit of background of uh, uh, what led him up to this point, um, other than uh, on, on the Zoom meeting, but in this part of his life. Well, it's 76 years. Uh, do you certainly want you want to get the whole thing? I don't well, think just, so. Well, just as convinced as you good. can. So just well, anyway, I, I was uh, uh, born in the North State. Uh, raised here in, in Reading, went to Shasta High School, uh, finished in 62. From here, went down to uh, four years in Santa Clara, and that was and graduated 66. And about that time, uh, Vietnam was uh, going in full swing and uh, wound up uh, for about four years in the service uh, after college uh, in first office, uh, officer candidate school in Virginia and then to Germany for two years, and then uh, finished out in Vietnam. I was uh, commissioned at uh, Fort Eustis, Virginia, and uh, was a second and first lieutenant in Germany, and then promoted to captain. And in Vietnam, uh, basically ran a uh, shallow draft vessel site uh, in Quignon, and then later deep draft vessel uh, stowage uh, operations at uh, the port of uh, Da Nang. What what are what are the shallow depth and deep depth? Would you like to speak? Shallow the shallow draft vessels oh, are yeah. like uh, the uh, LSTs. Uh, we were uh, they where they'll ram the beach. The uh, the vessel will open uh, open doors on the front end uh, on the bow of the vessel and disgorge. Uh, we were bringing in uh, light weapons, ammunition, and artillery rounds and various sundry uh, uh, supplies. Uh, to, for the troops uh, in the highlands and that. So in Quignon, uh, from, uh, we would unload the ships and also take uh, quite a bit of that. We were running motorized landing craft uh, that were crewed uh, up and down the, uh, down the coast of Vietnam to these other smaller ports. So we would transload off the LSTs and into what they called LCUs, landing craft utility. Uh, put the uh, the uh, uh, ammunition and supplies into those landing craft and run them down to Nha Trang or up to Chu Lai, uh, heading up towards Da Nang. Uh, at some point in the middle of the, the summer of 1970, uh, we took over the port from the Navy at Da Nang. So I moved up there, and with that, there were what they call deep draft vessels, which the doors don't, the bows don't open up. These are ocean-going vessels that uh, would uh, be pulling long hauls from the from the states, and uh, would go to the larger ports, Quint uh, Cameron Bay, and uh, and Da Nang, and with a lot of foodstuffs. Reaper ships would go in there as well as uh, as well as uh, dry cargo vessels, mm -hmm. and I ran an operation that uh, basically we would plan. Uh, Make the stow plans for the vessels so we didn't sink the ships at sea, and uh, yeah, make make sure that we were we were taking all of the different types of cargo properly, stowing them in accordance with Coast Guard regulations as well as uh, stowage principles, so you did.
didn't uh, uh, cause the ship to tilt one way or another, but to actually be able to brave, uh, uh, you know, extreme sea conditions if necessary. So when did when did you when did you leave Vietnam? I left Vietnam in December of 1970 and returned to the States to, uh, for the first time, see my four-month-old daughter who was born while I was overseas, and to uh, uh, retrieve my wife from her folks' uh, 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 grain farm up in upstate Minnesota and head west uh, to Pullman, Washington, where I was entering graduate school to uh, uh, work on a master's degree in economics. Did that for a couple of years. I was a teaching assistant there and, and actually taught economics, uh, micro and macroeconomics, as well as uh, took my graduate courses. Mm -hmm. And subsequent to that, because I was enamored of the transportation field, and watching the containerized vessels that were coming in and were more automated uh, into the Vietnam uh, theater of operations, uh, I went to work uh, in the uh, for Sealand Service, which was the uh, actually the innovator of containerized technology, containerized transportation. And so I worked for Sealand, and later Honeywell Aerospace, then later American President Lines, uh, in a, a rather diverse uh, field of occupations, everything from uh, operations to accounting and uh, international documentation to uh, sales. Uh, for, I had all the import accounts for the Pacific Northwest for American President Lines. And then I took a five-year hiatus with the Honeywell Aerospace, which was uh, the division that was actually working on undersea acoustic electronics and went into international marketing for Honeywell, working with foreign military, as well as uh, a lot of uh, offshore drilling, uh, commercial drilling operations, like the floating oil rigs in the North Sea and the like. We did a lot of different, rather exotic technologies that we were selling into those different market areas. Okay. I'm, I'm going to actually, uh, so I'm going to actually give, uh, give Ron a little bit to kind of catch up. <laughs> so we can actually get Ron from his youth through through the Vietnam War. Because you guys are both Vietnam War veterans, so kind of this and kind of in, into the '70s, and then we'll kind of go back and forth because I'll break it up a little bit. So, um, so Ron, so why, why don't you give me a little bit of your bio and background? Uh, I was born in Pennsylvania on my way to Austria. My father was career military. Um, basically, lived in Italy, Austria, and Germany until high school. And in the great wisdom, the army sent my father to Fort Ord as his last tour of duty. And since we've never had a stable home, that's where we settled. Uh, went to high school, college, got a burr up my backside and joined in 66, the army. Asked for Vietnam, got sent to Turkey. And then got sent from 66 to 72 or from 68 to 72, uh, served in Vietnam. I was a platoon sergeant. Basically, I had 50 men. Uh, everything from security with the Army Security Agency to straight leg infantry to airborne school. And then the last, last tour I did there, I was running armor in Vietnam. Forgot the deck enough times that finally they put me out uh, came back to California, asked to go into reserves, and ended up with 39 years in the service. Wow. So, needed a job, so back to college, became a nurse, went to work for Monterey County, then the state of California in the prison system as a hospital administrator, which is how I wound up here because I met my wife in Monterey, and she was born here in Reading. She's uh, Robert Dicker's daughter from the old Dicker's store. So taught for a few years, got disabled out of the Department of Corrections, taught for a few years, went to law school, finally says, I need to retire, retire. And my wife says, we're moving here. <laughs> so I've been here for about the last 15 years. So, um... Because I gave you guys some uh, some questions to kind of go over and start. Uh, so uh, you, 
um, just to tell us, Patrick, you ended up um, continuing on with different career aspects, but you ended up, did you, did you injure working life in Caltrans? Is that what? No, I, I work for the California Department of Corrections. Oh, no, I was, ask, I was actually asking uh, Patrick if he was. Oh, just, sorry. So I'm just, yeah, it's going to bounce back and forth a little bit. Yeah, so I, that's not too confusing. I think I took you uh, in the container shipping business and right. the aerospace business. That took me all the way up to about 1998, mm -hmm. at which point uh, the company that I uh, was with uh, sold out to a foreign entity. Mm -hmm. And a number of us uh, wound up uh, in consulting work in the Bay Area to dot com startup companies in systems and process. Uh, uh, types of applications. So business consulting. And while I did that, I also had uh, hooked up and uh, applied with the new technology and research group for Caltrans in Sacramento. So I uh, living in the Bay Area, but actually commuting to Sacramento on a daily basis, got old pretty tight, you know, pretty quickly. And so I uh, pursued a, a job with the uh, Caltrans District 4 in Oakland worked in mass transportation and then uh, uh, competed for a deputy district director job for external affairs for the Bay Area mm -hmm. and did that for several years. And then uh, at some point, uh, my mother, who was then in her 80s, my father had uh, passed away back in the 90s and mother was living alone on the ranch. And at that point, I thought I need to get back to Reading, be closer to her. Mm -hmm. And so we uh, arranged to, and I pursued a position up here in Caltrans District 2 and mustered out in 2009. Okay. So, okay. So, here uh, we go. Uh, back to you, Ron. Just, um, you, I'm, I'm trying to get some idea about your your family background a little bit. And then we're going to talk mostly, hopefully, about the North State. And you guys, that's, that's my, <laughs> to be sort of selfish, that's my main interest to find out what you guys know about uh, North State history. And when I, when I started looking at my family background, mm -hmm. I learned in college about the, 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 the push-pull relationship of immigration and found out that my mother's ancestors were Mennonites and Quakers. So they pretty much got one side got pushed out of Switzerland and wound up in land owned by the Prince of Orange and William Penn recruited them to come over on the Concord in 1683. That's the German Mayflower, what's on the US postage stamp. Uh, so they settled down as farmers. My other branch of the family was Quaker, who actually beat the German side by a year, coming over with Penn in the original Quaker groups, and eventually moved all the way out to Bucks County which is a good 30 miles away and settled as farmers there. And the two, the Mennonite side, my grandmother got a burr and married a Quaker. So she was so far out of the religion that she had to become a Quaker. And <laughs> during World War II, my mother said she should serve and joined the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps, which is the predecessors to the wax right. wound up in, in Jefferson Barracks, Missouri. And my father's side were all Scots Catholics who the king invited to come over here when they backed the wrong side in the rebellion in 1715 and wound up in Ohio. And he also had the military background, uh, ran away from home after the fourth grade and joined the military. And they met at Jefferson Barracks, and then I'm the result. Uh -huh. And it was only the odds that the Army picked where we were going to come. So that's pretty much the background on both sides. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give uh, um, Patrick, and then um, like I said, if, if you know, it's like I could let you run with it forever, but we're going to try to figure out and figure out where we can kind of uh, where do we cut it off? Where do we yeah. cut it off? So why don't we why do we start off like with the, sort of the as early as as far back as you can go because you went pretty far back. So how far back can you go with with family history? And uh, we're we're Ron has has a much more well defined lineage. Uh, we're probably a bunch of poor Irish Catholics for the most part, with the exception of. 
my German immigrant father, who my grandfather, Walter Kahn, who uh, was born in Erspring, Germany, and, uh, and back in the 1890s, and uh, his his father apparently had abandoned his mother, and his mother died, and he was living on a farm with his grandparents, and they wanted him to take over the farm, and he wasn't up for the farm. So he basically ran away and went to Bremen and uh, signed on with a, a three-masted schooner, apparently, and uh, was a cabin boy starting a, 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 on a ship's crew and plied the oceans for a while until... And what, what, area, what area is this? This is probably uh, right at the turn of the century, the 20th century. And then uh, from there, uh, he, uh, he was injured and burned aboard ship as the ship was approaching uh, New York, the port of New York. They took him ashore put him in a hospital and uh, as a young man and he uh, when he got out of the hospital and his burns were treated uh, the ship had left without him so he it's not like he had a lot of fervor for you know immigrating to the United States so there he was and his first job was as a steeplejack uh, hanging from ropes and painting uh, painting the steeples of the churches in New York and then worked odd jobs his, uh, his way out to the Midwest, where he met my grandmother, Lillian uh, McDonald, uh, who was the supervising nurse in an insane asylum. And he had set up uh, in Minneapolis, St. Paul, uh, a business for maintaining different, you know, hospitals and that. And so they met, in an, my grandparents met in an insane asylum uh, in St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, married in the, I think around 1918, something like that. And uh, they wanted to go, you know, Manifest Destiny was there for them, so they wanted to go to California. They moved to the San Fernando Valley, buying a chicken ranch site unseen, which turned out to be an arroyo, with probably a bunch of dead chickens and a rather disappointing sort of a threshold impression. But uh, uh, so they started there and my grandfather told my grandmother, because he was a very enterprising but stern kind of person, I'm leaving you and I won't come back until I have, you know, gainful employment in that. And he went to Long Beach and lo and behold, during the 30s, uh, he had built up a tire business and he'd worked for a tire shop uh, with uh, creating molds for tires to when he was in Minneapolis, St. Paul, before he, uh, before he did his uh, maintenance thing. And uh, so he started a tire business. And then during the, the war years up here, pardon me, when they were building Shasta Dam, uh, and after the 1932 earthquake in Long Beach, which almost devastated his business, uh, they determined to move north uh, so that he could make truck tires for the, the big trucks on the dam project here at Shasta Dam. So they came up here in about 1938. My mother was uh, most of she was born in St. Paul, wound up uh, uh, going to, to St. Anthony's High School in Long Beach and then to UCLA. So she was at UCLA when they moved north. And then she followed them up here and got a job as a music teacher uh, with Shasta County Schools. And she had 21 one-room schools. My grandfather set up his tire business here uh, in South Reading. In fact, uh, he, all, he had... Uh, had a large building that he shared with Meeks Lumber when they were first getting started. So uh, I think eventually when he moved his business down between Reading and Anderson on Old 99, uh, which is now Ohio State Route 273, um, uh, he eventually sold that business and he died at a relatively young age. He was uh, as, as strong and as uh, as tough as a person as he was, both he and my grandmother were pretty tough people. She'd been a cowgirl in Saskatchewan and then wound up in Winnipeg, Manitoba, going to nursing school while she was a governess for a British noble uh, who also had a, a flat in, uh, in Winnipeg. And when she finished at Misericordia Nursing School uh, and getting her, teach, her nursing credential, 
she went south of the border down into Minneapolis, St. Paul, and that's how she wound up at the mental hospital. So there's a lot of circular motion. You no, know, it's, it's it's yeah, it's it's a whole of the, the bouncing ball. But it's, it's like I was asking you earlier how you kept track of it because it's a story, which makes perfect sense. You can actually get a linear thing out of it. Um, so Ron, it, it was trying to get back to sort of broader some broader history. It's, but I'm also going to say in in your lifetime, what sort of significant events, historical events, just events that happened nationally or internationally. I don't want to say shaped you, but do you remember them that actually had an effect on you? you know, kind of any kind of insight into what uh, something along those lines? Actually, no. My ancestors probably influenced me more than national news. Growing up Quaker, you're brought up to serve. So anytime there's a need for service, that's what you're kind of expected to do. It becomes second nature. And so that's why I've always done things like the military, the police, nursing, teaching. And the only way I got into history was by moving to Igo and finding that there was nothing written. Mm -hmm. I didn't find any history on the area I lived in, except for maybe one paragraph here and there. And so we set about forming a group to resolve that problem. So but, how many how, how many how many books have you written about the North State at this point? Seven now. Seven books. And there's about five more in the works. Uh -huh. So how <laughs> how how challenging is it to to kind of dig up this information to, to find it? I mean, is it's because it's I mean, I'm guessing some of it's very very minimal in terms of what you have in terms of what was written down. So how do you so, how do you do what your detective work? How do you find out that information? Well, some of the material, depending on what they asked, like someone asked us to do a history of the Richland, Richland Baptist Church in Ono, Eagle Creek Baptist Church. Almost nothing available. So it's hours and hours and hours on ancestry, going over old documents, going to different libraries and seeing if they have anything that we've missed. And then some things like this last book on the copper towns of Shasta County, it just fell in place. A collector walked in and says, I've got this box of photographs. Can you, can you help me do a book on it? So some of the books, the, the older and the farther you get away from Reading, the harder it is to do the research. Right. The closer you are to Reading, the easier it is to do your research. And like the Shasta County Copper Towns was fairly simple in the sense that the period ran from the 1890s to really the 1920s. Okay. So there's an abundance of work done on the subject. Who brought you the pictures, Ron? Ralph Olibaugh. There it is. And Ralph and I were, were classmates at Shasta High. And he's probably uh, the possessor, if you will, of some of the largest collection of historical artifacts probably in the county, right, Ron? He's, he's got a tremendous uh, collection. And uh, I can remember when he, was, when he was collecting bottles way back when. But uh, he has a great penchant, if you will, for history. Ralph, would, you agree, would you agree, Ron? Well, Ralph Hollybaugh is what a lot of historians consider an enemy, the antique dealer who's destroying things. Ralph's the opposite. He's, he's he sells antiques to make a living, but he's a collector. And yep. he's a collector that believes history should be shared. So when we were living in Igo, he brought us a stack of material in a town called Bald Hills. Doesn't exist, hasn't existed since the late 1860s. Yeah. He wanted to share it, so we got a book done on it. He keeps finding us, no matter which history group we go to, and walks in and says, I've got this collection, and can you help me get it out to the public? So I give all the kadoos to Ralph on about half the books I've done. Now, where the, that's where the Peltier family was out in the Bald Hills too, right? Did you run into them at all? The Peltiers are 
from Whiskey Town. They right. left Whiskey Town Valley. and they made yeah. the dam. I can, I can. They were one of the few that didn't sell their land. They traded the BLM for sections in Igo. So they own the land that's now the, the old Piety Hill Cemetery. Yep. So the volunteers moved to, to Igo. And my wife went to school with a number of the daughters in Shasta High. Yep. Well, the Peltiers, there were four sets of twins. Yes. Three, three, one set died, three sets that survived, and then there were three other kids. And they, they had nine kids in their family when I was going to St. Joseph's, and we had nine kids in our family. And who would invite a family of nine to dinner, at nine, people, nine kids to dinner, other than another family of nine? You know, so we... We did a lot, and Clint Peltier was a timber cruiser. Uh, he was the head of the family, and he died in the in the house fire when the house uh, when the house uh, the caught fire just over by Benton Air Park, mm -hmm. and uh, and it was very tragic back in the early '60s. But uh, Chris Peltier and Judy were the twins that were my age, and Chris and I were very good friends. He passed away a couple of years ago. And he also served in Vietnam as well. So yeah, he was my neighbor at the ranch in Igo. And yeah. he was in the fourth division as a helicopter pilot in Vietnam. So the and I've heard so many stories about this. The what do you what do you guys do you guys have an opinion of the Igo owe no names? <laughs> And do you guys have an opinion about that? I'm sure you probably have an opinion, but I've heard so many uh, I go, oh no, or whatever. And then there's also Ogo. Oh, yes, I've heard that one as well. No, that's in the well, fact. Actually, that. Pe people used to take pictures of the sign because it read, I go, oh no, Ogo. Oh, and not only that, it was, it was uh, spectacularized in Ripley's Believe It or Not. Oh, I remember. Okay. You, did you ever see that, Ron? The, no. the, the copy of Ripley's Believe It or Not was uh, had the I go, oh no, and oh, go. <laughs> a little article on it that can you really believe this exists? So where, where was that sign? It was at the bottom on Clear Creek Road. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But oh no is, is a well-defined how it got its name. Yeah. Oh no is one of these towns who also got its name from the post office. They, they were, yeah, actually, you were you were talking about that earlier. That's before we right. went there. So maybe you should give, give me a little background about these one name because that was an interesting story. So we well, there was three. There was actually Prairie Diggings Junction, and then miners spread up Eagle Creek. Well, when the county bought the the county road in 1862, it moved it it bought an existing road that ran from Piety Hill to a sawmill on Eagle Creek bypassing both the original towns. So within a few years, they'd moved up to, to where the present town of Ono is and survived quite well there as a transportation site to mines going north, south, east, and west. Yeah. But they applied for a post office. And like I said, they had Eagle Creek, Colorado, and they wanted to be Eagle Creek, California and the post office said, no, this isn't going to work and refused to give them a post office until they came up with a name. And the miners picked Orofino and some of the ranchers picked other names. And finally, it went to Reverend Kidder, who was the Baptist minister out there. And he looked in the Bible and he came up with, and I don't know which book it came from, but he came up with a quote that we shall gather on the plains of Ono. So he proposed Ono. Post office liked it. And it officially be changed the name from Eagle Creek to Ono. Now, when they lost their post office, why they didn't go back to Eagle Creek, I don't know. But they have remained Ono ever since. Now, the Igo name, my guess is it's an old family name because there's there's some property out there that was Igo. But the story is that uh, when the Hearts Frabble mine was about to, to undermine the entire town of Piety Hill, the mining company 
looked for areas close by that were not gold producing. And they found the site at Igo. Well, when they wanted a post office, although most of the books say Piety Hill just quickly disappeared, it actually held on for about 20 years. So Piety Hill is off to one side, I goes at the other, and when they applied, the post office says, well, you can't be Piety Hill because it's over there. So the name I go stuck, and I, the, the story is that the mine supervisor who was looking for the new location had a son that kept going, I go, I go, because he wanted to go with his father. But I, there's no confirmation that that's how it really got its name. And they used to joke that it was, they were going to kick them out and, and it's like, oh no, oh no, we won't go. So that story is a little conflicting since the Chinese were never removed from Igo, Ono, Piety Hill, any of the towns in the Bald Hills. They were actually quite well valued because of the rough rock and the terrain. And they did most of the heavy lifting out there. So, so was, was the, the, was the name Ogo just a, a play off those two or was it Ogo actually- Ogo was a combination. Yeah, Ogo was done by the forest service. And it was a fire station out on old Bully, on old uh, Bully Shoop Road. Yeah. And it has been moved three or four times. And originally it was about 15 miles out, enough to be a trip for a day. And so it was called the Ogo Fire Station. And it just happened to be there were a few other ranches right there on Bully Shoop Road where it goes on Platina Road. So it got, it got the name, the name stuck. But over the years, the Ogo fire station kept getting closer and closer and closer to Ono. Well, right now it sits on the other side of the bridge in Ono. So they dropped it off the signs and we've always just been Igo and Ono since I've been up here 15 years or so. Yeah, no, I, I grew up here and I had not heard Ogo before. So I yeah, okay. it's, that's, that's really it, there's very few once you pass Ono, there was very few until you get out to Patrick's favorite town of Knob, yeah. which Harrison Gulch. And so it, it was kind of the halfway point between Knob and the end of the county or between Ono and the end of the county okay. and yeah. put it on the map. So there just wasn't that much else out there to name. <laughs> so how did how did you and uh, I go back to go back to Patrick? How did how did you get involved with you're you're involved with several both the guys involved with several historical societies? And other than I mean, how do you other than having you know stories and interests and stuff? How do you specifically get involved with the organizations to help preserve? history and, and pass on the information. How do you, how do you, how do you, how do you get involved with something like that? I think, you know, just like Ron is, is a very, very inquisitive person to begin with. And I think uh, that also sort of applies in our family. And my grandfather, Judge Carr, uh, was one of the founders of the Shasta Historical Society back in 1930. And if you drive around you drive around the county and even up in Lassen Park, there's a couple of, of uh, it's not e Clampus Vitus uh, uh, signs up there or plaques. They're Shasta Historical Society and they were early on. And there was, I think it's just like the passion that Ron was talking about, that at some point you want to say, you know, we should try to preserve when nobody's keeping track of the history of this. And I think there was a, a number of people to include uh, May Helene Bacon Boggs, who also had the, the, the art collection out at Old Shasta mm -hmm. and the like. But there were a number of people that were, uh, I think, uh, historically inquisitive to begin with and also saw a real need, especially since the second gold rush occurred up in this part of the state at uh, what, uh, at Redding Bar, mm -hmm. uh, Major Redding's Bar on Clear Creek, then in fact, a lot of this stuff should be documented and that the local, you know, the local should do it. So our family has been involved. My father 
my grandfather and my mother actually wound up, uh, Marie Carr wound up as president, even in, at 94, I think she was, she was still uh, involved uh, with the Shasta Historical Society, as well as the Anderson, Histor Anderson Historical Society, and actually uh, started a, a, an initiative, which I think Ron is involved with now, to bring all of the historical societies together from Ono, oh from Fort Crook up in Fall River, from Shasta uh, uh, Lake Heritage and Historical Society, and bring all those folks together in sort of an effort to coordinate and at least understand what all information is out there on the history of this, not only this county, but what are the legacies and the linkages to the state and national history? You know, we, we really under dignify the significance of Shasta Dam until you go back. Actually, I was in Hyde Park at the, uh, at the Roosevelt Museum. Franklin Roosevelt uh, at Hyde Park in New York, go in there and because I wanted to see if they had anything on Judge Carr because I have a picture of my grandfather on the back of the whistle stop train that Governor Roosevelt, before he was ever president, had whistle stopped in Reading in September of 1930, I think 32, mm -hmm. and it's Governor Roosevelt from New York and, and Judge Carr on the back of this rail car. So I thought, I wonder if this picture is in the archives, the National Archives, at the Roosevelt Presidential Library. And sure enough, there it was. But on top of that were a number of other documents that talked about the criticality in World War II of hurrying up the construction of Shasta Dam so they could get the hydro, uh, hydroelectric operation going to basically power the shipbuilding uh, operations down in Richmond and the Bay Area, where the, the Kaiser ship, the shipbuilding yards and the like. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a, quite a bevy, if you will, of, of correspondence back and forth between the War Utilities Board uh, during World War II and trying to push the completion of, of Shasta Dam, or at least getting, a, getting enough water behind the dam to start turning those turbines uh, up at Shasta Dam. You know, so. There is a legacy here uh, in the North State, not only of people, but also public works projects uh, extending into the, the you know, uh, Trinity Lake and, and Lewiston Lake and Whiskey Town Lake, the Central Valley Project, mm -hmm. uh, flood control. The Flood Control Act of 1944 was specifically driven to deal with the flooding that took, took place annually which was wiping out ranches and farms up and down the Sacramento River watershed, uh, well into well into the 40s, and that was the prime motivator for building Shasta Dam. And the collateral benefits were water, you know, recreation and and power and the like. But the first and most critical thing was this place used to when that river would start going, and then you had the Feather River joining in in the middle of the winter, you had these raging torrents that would come down these canyons, you know, and you can go to old, old Sacramento, right, Ron? And mm -hmm. that place used to be underwater. If you, if yeah. you go into I've that. Heard it, I've heard it described as an inland ocean, basically. An inland sea. And there's, and the same thing with the river boats. They, the uh, Red Bluff was actually the, uh, I think there's, a, there's a book about Red Bluff being the, the, the end of the river boat, uh, mm -hmm. uh, where the river boats would take a lot of the gold mining supplies and that up to as far up river as as Red Bluff, although uh, Pearson Redding actually was successful in getting a river boat all the way to Latona, which is you know now by the flea market. Right, uh, right. Us, okay, and Lat Latona, that's the farthest north or up the river that a river boat ever got, and uh, it it was such. A pain to get it that far that they decided they didn't want to negotiate or navigate China Rapids and a few of these other things on that river. So, uh, and then eventually the riverboat uh, transportation faded out, I think. But you start looking at public works projects, and actually even the the fallout and the impact of that. That quite frankly, in 1960, the, the presidential election in 1960. Uh, of the 58 counties of California, guess which county had the highest Democratic Party vote 
or Democrat vote for Kennedy Johnson over Nixon Lodge. Shasta County went 65.2 percent uh, for Kennedy Johnson over Nixon Lodge. I think uh, Nixon actually won California, but the highest vote was in Shasta County, and I know that because Dad was had run Kennedy's campaign mm -hmm. up here. But you start looking at and why? Because of the public works projects. You had Whiskey Town being built. You had Trinity Dam and Trinity Lake. You had Lewiston Dam and Lewiston Lake. And they were punching I-5 to the Upper Sac, uh, Upper Sac Canyon, all at the same time that U.S. plywood was going full tilt. And those were all well-paying union jobs. Shasta County was one of the more affluent counties in the state back in 1960. Hmm. And if you look at how they, not only the, the political demographics shifted, but also because of a lot of intervening kinds of things, the industrial demographic of the North State you know, and all these public works projects when they dried up and the spotted owl showed up and a bunch of other things, pretty soon there were some other issues that entered in that affected the, you know, affected the, the economic profile of the North State, I think. Mm -hmm. I, maybe I'm wrong, but I, I sort of look at this and I said, what was happening back then? Mm -hmm. and, you know, so it's fascinating when you see the legacy of not only the the public works projects, but who is in the leadership and who are the people, who are the, the movers and shakers? You think back to the 60s, you had Harold T. Biz Johnson, who was the ex-mayor of, Re of Roseville, mm -hmm. was the U.S. congressman, and, and you had Pauline Davis from U Yuba City, and she was our assembly person. You had the only U.S. senator to ever come from north of Sacramento, uh, Red Bluff High School alumnus, Claire Engel, <laughs> who graduated from Red Bluff High at 16, wound up becoming uh, the youngest DA in the United States, probably at age 23, uh, and graduated from Hastings Law School and passed the bar at 21 years old. All these guys were in congressional seats at the time and probably moved pretty well to bring home the bacon, if you will, and bring home public works projects and public works money to the North State. And Ron, what do you think? Do you, do you agree with that? I think they all did well, but my concern has always been for the little guy, which yeah. I, the question was, how do we get the little guy interested in all this? When I first moved here, we had historical groups at Cottonwood, active at Millville, the uh -huh. Reddit Museum, they're all closing. And it's like how to get people back into to doing history and yeah. one way is the way Shasta historic and Anderson does by we have free research we're trying to get people back in to answer questions we know it's hard to find resources so we make resources available we put articles online yeah we, if we get an email about someone just wrote me about treats alley in in, and, in Anderson well so we'll try and find the answers for Treat Alley. We find that there's a lot of people that don't have a lot of connection, but are just interested in the history. Sure. They like to get it. And right now, uh, there's about four groups that if we combine and go together, we can make a clearinghouse to entice more people in. I mean, our group is looking at trying to get high schools to do writing projects for high school writing, to get high school docents, to get, so there's, I really don't know that anyone has the correct answer yet of how to interest people in local history. Well, let me ask you a critical question that is, and that is, I was just talking with my old roommate from college today about this very thing, is evolving uh, uh, internet technology and, you know, intelligent, IT kind of stuff is the IT world benefiting it perhaps increases access for a lot of people to information but from the standpoint of generating creative uh, creative uh, expression and research is it a is it a plus or a minus how, how do you perceive technology and the impact of technology on you know on historical research? And even more importantly, recording history. You are somebody that records a lot of history and you do it very well. But 
you know, if you and I were gone, okay, and if our generation is gone, is it going to be more videography and less uh, uh, expression in the King's English? Or is it going to be, you know, or is there going to be sort of a resurgence of the written word, if you will? I took a graduate class in Freudian psychology, uh -huh. at which I walked in the first day and the professor says, you need to go buy these 27 books. We're going to go one book a week until we finish them all. And I found that Freud was smart enough to say, you know, I don't know all the answers, but I'm going to write these books that I have ideas for and get them out there so the next generation can look at them and do a better job. Right. Well, I look at history the same way. We need to get the history out to the public so that future researchers can then take that material. There is, with what limited resources we have, we make mistakes. There's no author that I've found that's done, including myself, that does a 100% perfect job. But if we get it out there, the next generation can do a better job and a better job and a better job. Technology helps us get it out there, but it also comes with that caveat of beware that not everything that's out there is true. A lot of it needs to be researched and changed. Do you think as a culture though, that from a behavioral standpoint, that we sort of view a lot of that as waiting to be fed history or do you think that there is an activist uh, pursuit and you have a great passion for going out and doing research, but a lot of this information sort of comes to people without them digging themselves and pursuing it. Am I making sense with this dichotomy? Yeah, I think that everybody has an innate nature to question where they are and how they got here. Right. That within the scope of a limited scope of Shasta County, but to the extent that we can help them answer that innate question, they have to get to a point where they want to ask it. Yeah, yeah. But when they do ask it, it's it's Shasta Historical, Anderson Historical, Shasta Lake, Fort Crook that are going to be the ones that will help ask answer it because mm -hmm. they're the ones that are still trying to gather everything in. It's a, Do you think people actually, as they're resource. driving by, as they're driving by a Shasta Dam or whatever, uh, and they see it and it's impressive and all the rest of it, do you think they actually go to the next step of saying, "Gee, I wonder how that got there"? Uh, I, I, that, to me, that's that is sort of one of the critical questions around, you know, having a passion for historical research, and even asking a lot of questions. Are we a, a still an inquisitive kind of a culture, or do you think we just sort of take spoon-fed information and just say, oh, that's nice? My concern is we're still, a, we're still an inquisitive nation, except that most of the research requests we get are from middle age and above. Uh -huh. That's why Anderson is trying to focus as much on possible of getting elementary students to actually come to the museum, yeah. Uh, getting a high school writing program, even if it's just tell me the story of your family in, in Shasta County. That's good, Ron. And I, I think you've hit on something critical because we, uh, I, I sort of look at it and I usually tell people, they say, well, are you into history? I'm going, history is five minutes ago. I said, you know, we keep thinking history has to be 19th century stuff. And that's not necessarily true. You know, what happened in the 1950s and 60s? You know, in fact, uh, one of the questions uh, that Rob had given us, I think, was what world events were significant uh, to me personally? And as I thought about this, I thought the Korean War, newsreels at the Cascade Theater, okay, during during the Korean War, <laughs> Joe Stalin and the, and, the, and the atom bomb, the Cuban Missile Crisis and the assassination of John F. Kennedy, while I was at college, Freedom Riders in the South, and of course, uh, uh, the Watergate hearings, detente with Russia and opening trade with China with when Zhou Enlai was uh, the uh, Deputy Prime Minister uh, with Henry Kissinger. 
the polio pandemic and the salt vaccine, Vietnam and the draft, and innovations in technology like containerized transportation, television, and personal computers. Those are the things that sort of popped into my head just on a, you know, a basically a spontaneous mode. I can recall Sig Krigsman, who had the, uh, the Coca-Cola plant here. He was one of the, they lived down the street from us, and they were one of the first people to ever have a television in Reading. And we would go, we'd go down to their house, all the kids in the neighborhood, to watch Pinky Lee and Howdy Doody. You know, I mean, I, this obviously ages me. You can tell <laughs> I go back a ways. But the whole concept of this new technology, I can recall after, after mass, dad taking us kids over to uh, uh, Johnny Bartosh's cigar store at the downstairs in the Golden Eagle Hotel and buying the Sunday paper, the examiner, and we would go home to our house on Olive Street and my sister and I would lie on the floor and we'd turn on KBCB radio and they would have the Sunday funnies, people that would actually be Dagwood and, Dagwood and Blondie and we would follow them in the cartoons in the examiner uh, as they would have noisemakers, you know, for things crashing and all the rest of it. And we would basically bring the comics alive on a Sunday morning. This is probably before TV was hitting Reading. And it's fascinating to me what happened locally, because later on in the 60s, Dad and George Flaherty, who was the mayor of Reading, were back testifying before Congress. And Uncle Jim, who was a consulting engineer to the Interior Committee, had heard about a federal communications license that was available. And on the way home, George and Dad decided they were going to get a, a bunch of investors together, and they built Channel 7. And this, you know, you look back and you're going, things just didn't happen. I mean, you know, they, there was sort of an evolution. And what you and I have lived through just in terms of technology advances, you know, and the same thing. I've got a picture of Grandpa Carr. Okay, this is when he, this is when he was Justice of the Peace, and then down at the Shasta Historical Society, there's a picture of him on a horse in front of Old City Hall. Well, that was 1907, and by 1937, 30 years later, he was president of AAA for California. You know, I mean, you start looking at it, and you're going. Things just are moving along locally, and it's your point, Ron, right on, is that locally and in our own lives, we are experiencing evolution, you know, and historical evolution in technology as well as political events and the like. And I sometimes wonder if we are, if we are as activists in seeking out knowledge and lessons from the past, or if we're simply spoon-fed information and visuals you know, from media without ever, with just accepting it without saying, what does that mean to me? And what are the, you know, what are the implications of knowing that that happened? So my, my quick question, I guess, to both you guys leading off of that is, do you, do you think, and I have an opinion as well, do you think people are, are less critical? Are people just, the because of how things, you can go to um, YouTube even, and you can have like, a hundred different people. I, right now, I'm doing a, a, because I work in media and stuff. I'm right. actually on a camera kick, and I uh, I've been doing a lot of research over cameras, and I, there's there's dozens of those people with ideas about a couple of individual cameras I'm kind of looking at, but they all contradict each other. <laughs> there's no there's no standard. There's no and it's just whether you believe or agree with the person. And I just wanted you, you know, think things are critical. And do you think things like, I mean, sort of, the, use the word correctly or not, uh, democ democratizing things like like Wikipedia, which is, uh, uh, yeah, that kind of thing. Is it critical? Is it helping? Is it good? Or does it, it, and I guess everything has a dark side, but what do you guys think in terms of how people are critical or Wikipedia is a good thing or? The, those things that influ influence me when, when I moved up here was not the positive. There's lots of positive things to talk about in Shasta County. It's the negatives that don't get in history. Uh, the state of California has a long history. You can read a book like Murder State, uh, 
of things we did to the Native Americans, the Chinese, uh, Black families in Reading. There's a large negative history that needs to be history. So history does some good. I don't know that Wikipedia, anyone who it's like, you need to say what really happened. History needs to say the good with the bad to get a dialogue. If we just IT it to death and give it lots of, lots of, it's, it's like my real hate is the likes and dislikes on like feedback things that stores want, that, that what it, what's Facebook wants, that other groups want. It takes away the definition of history. History is both that which is good and which is bad. Right. If, if, if an IT unit does it that way, it does give access to Native Americans to get their story out. Good. But if it just pat feeds us the history we want to hear to make us feed good, that's bad. So I love IT because I couldn't be doing all the research and everything at home. But I really fear IT if we let it become a democratized society of someone telling us what we need rather than having a discussion of how do we prevent this from happening again. You know, Ron, you are you're, 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 to get into the future. You're, you're hitting on something, I think, really sort of critical and has to do with our, our culture and our behavior, you know, and I, I, I told a priest one time, I said, you know, if I, if I go to church at some point I, before, before I go to, when I first arrive, I sort of go through the 10 commandments. I said, but I always struggle to get past the first commandment, which is false idols. And I said, the irony of it all is, is that my false idol isn't even a fun God. It's the god of distraction in a media age where I'm basically in data overload. So it's not even, I'm not getting much out of it other than just trying to, you know, tread water in, you know, in data overload. So it's, to me, it's often a question of, do I have the ability to, to seek out, you know, something, do I have an appetite to perform my life ethically? And looking at the issues that you're talking about, you know, about uh, racial discrimination and, you know, sexual uh, discrimination and harassment and all those things, how am I driven? What is my ethical nature? And, and am I driven to ask the questions? And it's interesting, when I lived in Chicago, I went to a, uh, it was a seminar on meditative practices, but I thought the best part of the evening was this little preamble talk where this guy says, the money line came when he said, we are creating the greatest generation of reactive thinkers in the history of the human species at the expense of our contemplative dimension. And I thought, wow, what a money line. He says, you know, I thought, what's that? Does that mean that everybody's waiting for the next instruction set, but nobody's asking why? You know, and as a culture, as we evolve as a society, are we driven to still have an appetite to not only think critically, but in the area that you're talking about, it's not just the facts that are coming at us, but also the, the other dimension, which is almost the irrational dimension, which is feelings. How do we feel about the facts? And oftentimes people are outraged and oftentimes people just say, I don't wanna think about that. It's too much to think about. And to me, it's fascinating to ask the question, who are we as a culture? Where are we going in this country and in, uh, you know, in in our technology intensive world right now? And is technology always sort of good? Is it bad? Or is it simply, do we use technology the way that was, you know, originally hopefully intended? And to me, what you're talking about, Ron, is right on. I, I think that Mr. Gates in his program has found the answer that we, we, we all kind of look for in the sense that he starts research not knowing where it's going and is yeah. honest about what he finds. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad, but it's all history. Mm -hmm. 
So I, one of the reasons, it's one of the few shows I watch on TV is because it's history as real history. So, and yes, I think we are moving more towards a non-questioning world. And hopefully events like this one will make at least a few questions. Well, it's Joe Friday, right? Just the facts, ma'am. And of course, it's more than just the facts. It's what do the facts tell us and what what are the rules and you know and mores that we set up as a society that cause us to interpret the facts and then to make some ethical or moral determination as to what we think of that. And of course, you go one step further with, uh, you know, how you report it and what you report based on your ethics and your beliefs. So it's, you know, well, it's always muddled stuff up. I think that's just how people work, unfortunately. And if, if your question was a good one about significant events, because every one of those, I had a strong feeling one way or another about mm -hmm. every one of those events. When it came to the, the atom bomb and we were at the nuns at St. Joseph's, were uh, having us do the, the, uh, the bomb drills, okay, crawling under the desk yeah, and all the rest of it. Yes. That, was, that was the emotions of fear, flight or fight. You know, Vietnam, there were a lot of very strong passions and feelings around that whole episode. And there are strong feelings right now. All you got to do is turn the TV on. And, and it's fascinating what the pundits can do to excite you. But you have to ask yourself, am I reacting in a reactive mode or am I reactive in a, you know, reacting in a contemplative mode? Am I driven by contemplation and sort of weighing it against my, my code of ethics and conduct? And to me, it's, it's a question of what you learn probably at an early age how you're you know what what culture you come out of and, and what you're taught mm -hmm. so my I'm trying to figure where we're at. who inspired me when i was growing up john f kennedy okay mm -hmm. and i don't necessarily i don't know about his private life but he had the ability to charm and I think he was a very charming personality to the press. He was straightforward. He was eloquent. Uh, he also was not perceived necessarily. He was, I, I think my father and a lot of people uh, were enamored because he was, he was a young, he was 43 years old, right? When he was elected president. Mm -hmm. uh, my father inspired me, you know, when he was DA, they actually tried to assassinate him because he put his foot down, and uh, even though he's getting pressure from, you know, from people on city council and elsewhere to sort of go light on illicit activity in Shasta County, he was right out of Georgetown Law School and said, I took an oath, and I will live up to my oath. And uh, they actually, there was a guy named Smiling Jack Lacey that was hired by some locals to kill him. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think uh, Governor Warren's uh, 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 investigators were involved. And Sheriff Sublet finally arrested Smiling Jack Lazy to the floor of a Greyhound bus, and he was on his way to assassinate my father, who was basically living up to his oath. So what, what year is this? That was 19, it would have been uh, 1939. He started, matter of fact, he met with Earl Warren in a hotel room because he was getting pressure locally to sort of go light on some of the activity, and he went down and met uh, with the Attorney General, before Governor, Attorney General Earl Warren in San Francisco. And he said, uh, there's concern that if I start enforcing too much, all the, all the illicit activity will move over the county line in the Tehama County. And I want your commitment that, you know, as Attorney General, we'll, you know, we're trying to eradicate illicit activity. And there were a lot of people that were, you know, community leaders in that, that dad actually had to go after that were breaking the law. Mm -hmm. And I'm certain Judge Carr, his father, knew all those guys and grew up with them and everything else. So it was, it was not an easy thing. But, uh, you know, I'll, I will never forget when dad passed away, the Knights of Columbus stood guard over his casket at Sacred Heart uh, Church overnight. He laid basically his casket lay in state overnight at Sacred Heart Church in Anderson. Well, a lot of his old friends and people that, you know, respected him uh, 
basically, and then they had the, the 21 gun salute the next day. Uh, my mother, bearing nine kids, and uh, as well as housing her paraplegic sis- sister in law and my grandmother, you know, uh, and a phenomenal energy. She was a music teacher in the county, taught in one, 21 one room schools uh, around the county. And uh, was always involved, as Ron knows, she was involved with the Shasta Historical Society. And uh, was, and she was very passionate about certain issues. And she would show up to testify before the Board of Supervisors, the Reading City Council, on issues that she felt strongly about. Uh, and then the other people that actually influenced me, I think, or inspired me, were, and you're probably with this too, Ron, a lot of the old movie stars. And, you know, you can think of the ones that you always thought they had great, they had great parts. One of the ones that was like, that was Gregory Peck, you know, in his role in the big country on the beach to kill a mockingbird, uh, Moby Dick, MacArthur, Sidney Poitier, and guess who's coming to dinner or in the heat of the night is Mr. Tibbs, right? And James Stewart. I look at those people, those personalities along with the roles they played, were always inspiring to me. They were always men of noble intent, trying to do what was right. Uh, you know, the same thing uh, with uh, Kirk Douglas in uh, Lonely or the Brave and Spartacus. You know, so I, I think back to when I was in high school, and these were, a lot of these are movies that were in the 50s and 60s, but they really had a profound effect on how I viewed my world, and they sort of Short up your your own ethical orientation about stand up for what's right. Have some courage to stand stand behind your values. Uh, anyway, then you said, "What is one thing that I never want to forget? That we're only here for a short time, and it's important how we treat each other." You know, I mean, your questions were good ones, Rob. As far I, as I, I tried, I tried it because I had I I told them from like eighty questions, so I tried to get. You know what I was trying to get out of this, and I was gonna. I think one of my questions was, "What do you guys see for the future of Reading?" But I'm not gonna go there because it's like, what, what does that mean? Because I mean, it's Reading professionally shocks me. It's like we have a skyline now. It's just how, how does that happen? It was just it's it's happened pretty quickly. Uh, but I think the question is, what do you see for your in terms of the viability and what what do you want your your I guess now your historical societies do. You kind of have touched on this, and what do you want? Uh, what do you think might be a practical way in the future to kind of stay relevant and, and viable as as organizations? I mean, I'll throw that to Ron first to see what you sure. might think about in terms of the future. Well, I think the only way to stay viable is to continue to address the needs of the public. So I think all history groups have to evolve the same way people evolve over time. Um, we, we've seen so many clothes that I think the only way is to look at it and say, we all have the same problems. We have trouble fundraising. We have trouble getting docents. We have trouble with this. We have trouble finding research. And the only way to do it is to expand, not in the sense of taking away individual sections of the county yeah. from various groups, but by coming together and forming a larger research group, a larger, uh, a larger support group with common, with common aspirations and common problems. Yeah. I think if we try to all go it alone, we're, we're going to be with the dodo bird on Mauritius Island gone. <laughs> Oh, is is there is there an existing coalition of your of your historical museums or it, societies? It, it, there's the answer. There's a two part answer. One is uh, one is that the historical societies get together. Mother started that actually, Ron. What probably about ten years ago, getting all the historical societies in the county together. And two, what Ron is suggesting was the vision and really the strategic question that confronted the quote. Shasta Historical Society, which when it was looking at itself strategically, we said, are we the Reading Museum 
a historical museum or are we a countywide historical society? And in 1930, the original vision of Judge Carr and the people that started that was that it was a countywide effort that Ron is sort of hinting at, you know, where you had people out in Ono, you had people at Fall River, you had people up at Castella, and they all had really peculiar histories. But this one umbrella organization uh, was sort of set up to grab all that and put it into a central repository, if you will. And now that we have uh, digital technology and all the rest of it, uh, the, the concept of the Shasta Historical Society was hopefully migrating towards what Ron is talking about as a platform for all historical societies to maybe be able to, you could do a computer link if you were down in the Bay Area and had a question about Knob or about Ono, that you could go to the Ono Historical Society via the Shasta Historical Society. So you have basically an umbrella organization that has the resources necessary to host a lot of satellite organizations. The problem you run into oftentimes is, and Ron has already hinted to this, is the, the financial or fiscal viability of all these smaller organizations that we're all sort of in competition with each other, if you will, for what scarce resources there are in the county to perpetuate historical research, you know, and achieve that end. And I think trying to get everybody on the same page to me is a monument, a much more demanding and daunting task than one would think, you know, especially when everybody, there's a certain amount of pride in authorship and there's a certain amount of intimacy that attends to being down in Anderson Cottonwood or uh, being up in Shasta Lake. And everybody's got their own special little histories. So then it's a question of what is it that this umbrella organization, if it is the Shasta Historical Society, what is it doing? And is there a Reading Museum, a Reading Historical Museum? We have Turtle Bay, but I don't know how much of Turtle Bay. Ron, do you have an idea of how much is the historical research as a, a repository of Reading history in the Reading area that the Turtle Bay is? They have a, an extensive collection. They have an Are they, but do they do artifact it? collection. They, they tend to go at it in artifact display by putting up displays rather than which is limited for some of the other groups. Right. So Turtle Bay has found its niche and is doing fairly well. They're looking at rotating displays, mm -hmm. large material. It's a piece of the puzzle that's needed. Is there a red is there a Reading Historical Society? Maybe that's the that's the strategic question. The Shasta Historical Society still is on that brink of, of are we representing everybody, which is coming to coming to pass that we're all talking, we're all sharing. Right. Sure. It's like you ask about the books I wrote. One was written from the Ono group, given to Shasta to help them out. Of the next set of books. They, they were, one was done by Anderson Historical. Uh -huh. Four other books we did, or actually five other books we did at Anderson Historical were given to Shasta to help them out. We're looking to get where we can help, where we can maintain individuality, but solve common problems. Right, right. That's where Shasta Historical comes in. They have a professional staff. They can provide seminars that other people can share. Right. And that's a work in progress. It, it isn't, we're not there yet, but at least we're heading that way. Right. But you didn't answer my question. Is it a Reading Historical Society or is there such a thing? I think when I first moved here, it pretty much was an old Shasta Reading Historical Society. Yeah. I think you're right. It's progressively, progressively expanded its, its outreach to include other areas. Because right. these people aren't from one area of the county. They, it's like B.F. Loomis is yeah. 
daughter went to high school in Anderson. He had a photographic shop in Anderson. He married into the Loomises from Ono. Right. And their that's son the, had the shop in Reading. That's the guy who took the pictures at the Lassen eruption. Right. Okay. He's BF Loomis, right? But he was, he got interested in photography. Yeah. And went to another Loomis shop in Reading. Well, that Loomis isn't a relative, but they hap he happened to meet the, the, the sister of the guy who was running the shop. Right. Mrs. Loomis got married and became Mrs. Loomis. Kind of one of those Roosevelt stories. Oh, yeah. Stayed. But it's one of those, so people in this county tend to move to, they're at Shingletown in, in the summer, they're at Anderson or Reading in the winter, they have mines here. We all share a common history. So if I, if I, I catch your drift a little bit, that we've, we've sort of evolved and we're, it's almost like goes around, comes around, because if you go up to Lake Helen at Lassen, uh, there's a big plaque there that uh, tells about Lake Helen and uh, the Bumpuses and I think that, and uh, that, the plaque says Shasta Historical Society. The same thing with the Nobles Trail plaque over on the Park Road heading towards Manzanita Lake. That's a historical society. The same thing with uh, uh, Fort Redding over off uh, uh, Durst Road. That's a plaque that was put there by the historical society. So what you're talking about is that at some point, and I think when my grandfather was on the, the original board for the Historical Society, Shasta Historical Society, it was countywide, and they were looking at all kinds of locations all around the county, and they were putting up plaques, and you know, uh, I think the same thing down there with the uh, Reading Adobe, which actually isn't, that plaque isn't even close to the Reading Adobe, it's off, uh, it's off Main Street in Cottonwood, just uh, right across from the auction yard. But, you know, so that was the scope, I think, that the original historical society was looking at was to be the host for the entire county. And then what you wound up with eventually is the, these different satellite locations as they built the dam or did other things. There was such a plethora of information available that locally they started their own societies. And uh, to me, it's, it is an interesting uh, strategic challenge, if you will. But what do I know? <laughs> but that's, and that's and that's another history too. Anyway, you guys, uh, I think we're going to wrap it up here. It's actually we could keep going because <laughs> has this accomplished what you wanted to? Accomplish? Oh, I, 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 I didn't. Well, actually, I think I had an idea, but it, it went in a better direction than I anticipated. So because I was like, you have these parameters of what you're looking for, but I think you're sort of what you guys ended up talking about, which I didn't even anticipate. You're talking about the history of the history, almost. Which is really very interesting. It's because it's you you not just political, but just just some stuff that uh, I, I wasn't aware of. I mean, is are there pictures somewhere of I go Ono Ogo that exists still somewhere? Yes. Ralph Oliver probably has a few. <laughs> I would imagine if that's, anybody that's, if that's anybody just, does. That just fascinates me because actually I just and especially place names. And I have a I have an idea for a, a show someday when I have free time, whatever that means. Um, to uh, do a, 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 a show about place names and where they came from. Well, but, who did that book, Ron? Was it Steger? Did she do the place names book? Shasta County did, place name? He was or, one of them. It was an earlier edition, but Steger did the the place names of Shasta County. That's what I thought. Yeah, it wasn't Dottie Smith. It was Steger, right? No, Dottie didn't do that book. Yeah. Well, actually, I appreciate you guys' time. This has actually been really interesting. Like I said, it's 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 better than I, I, not that I didn't expect much out of it, but I was sort of trying to structure, but it's, it's been a better conversation, I think, than talking about, uh, um, I guess, the history of, of the history of, <laughs> of the North State. Well, let me tell you, I learned a lot tonight about Ron Jolly, and I think I've, you know, I, I've underappreciated the, the breadth of uh, the writings that you've done, Ron, and also uh, you've, you've, you've imparted opinions to me about things, but the, you know, on occasion through the, at the Anderson Historical Society, but you are just a remarkable human being as far as the things that you've done that are, you know, truly a credit to you and a great credit to the county. And 
you know, to trapping history and putting it in some sort of cogent format so that you excite people to say, we've been this way before, you know, especially when you start looking at super fun sites <laughs> on Iron Mountain and all the rest of it, all of a sudden it brings the, it brings some significance, you know, to what it is that modern day concerns are when it comes to environmental policy or uh, 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 respecting different cultures. And, you know, uh, your pursuits, my friend, are, are very impressive. It's a work in progress. Yeah, it's, it's, it's all a work in progress. And actually, I'm, I'm hoping I can tap you guys for some other stuff because I have some ideas about local history and uh, you guys seem to be a really, really great resource in terms of that. So um, with that, I'm going to thank you again and I appreciate your guys' time and I'm glad you were able to uh, both show up this evening and have a, have a very good conversation. Very good. Thank Please you. Please give my best too. Will do. Okay. All right. Good night. Good night.